Greetings and welcome. We are in Senior English B. And today we now will turn to really one of the greatest poets in the English tradition, W.B. Yeats. You should have your hymnal open to 1138, 1139. You want to be looking, first of all, at the literary analysis intel on 1138, as well as the stuff in bold under reading strategy, especially the analyzation of Yeats's philosophic systems and assumptions. And then finally, of course, those six vocabulary words that you will absolutely be certain are going to end up on an exam. Okay? You know that those words are coming, so it would make sense to preview those words. And then, of course, when we see those words in our conversations here in a bit, when we look at the text themselves, We'll obviously want to maybe make some connection, some, connect, some connectiveness to it. Let's go ahead now and talk about Yeats as a poet that for your notes we will label as romantic visionary. Romantic visionary. I'm following the work of other scholars when I use this term. It is not a term of my own invention. However, I'll try to amplify as I go. I've used two what seem to be radically contrastive terms. The romantic writers we will speak of as being those writers who have a tendency to look backwards to a time when things were simpler, to a time when things were easier to understand. We might say less complicated. We might say pre-industrial revolution. The great romantic writers of Wordsworth, Coleridge, Byron Shelley Keats, right? Those romantic poets have a tendency to celebrate the Greek tradition when life was so much simpler, so much easier to understand, less complex, dare we say it, less modern. Visionary, everything related to looking forwards. Yeats, you can see his dates right there on 1139. Notice, interestingly, how his life scans two centuries. The end of the 19th century the first half almost of the 20th century. So in other words, this cat was able to see and experience a tremendous dynamic change that we referenced as the Industrial Revolution. Yeats then is going to offer us a vision, a predictive power of the future. And in fact, his poem, Second Coming, will often be referenced as a poem of prophecy, predicting the things to come. Take a look at the date. He dies in 39. Right? So in other words, he will have experienced the First World War. Right? But then there's the Second World War that will soon come right after his death. And Gates was already kind of predicting some of the challenges to come. Now I want to turn and talk about the movement from the 19th to the 20th century. And I want to talk about this term modernism. Okay? So let's talk about this term for a second in this experience. It's fascinating to go back. You guys were all born when, roughly? 95, 96, 94, 95, 96. It's fascinating to go back to the newspapers and online comments that were made December the 31st, 1999. So you can all of a sudden put yourself in, how old was I? December the 31st, 1999. In room 303, Days in advance of this date, the buzz was interesting and intense. Why? We were nearing, of course, the end of the 19th, of the 20th century. Yes, we were ready to begin a new century. Lots and lots of people are writing about what the future is going to be like. What will this 21st century look like, be like, what good, what bad? A hundred years earlier, same thing was happening. And if you go back and you read those newspapers, it is fascinating to read the stuff that was being published the last year of the 19th century. For example, editorials that said things like this. The 20th century will be the century when poverty is wiped out. There will be no more poverty. People will learn how to distribute goods in such a way that there will no longer be poor kids. Are you ready for this one? The 20th century will be the century where there's no hungry children because the technologies will allow us to grow so much food 
that it would be impossible to imagine that anybody on this planet would ever go hungry again. No kidding. Their essays are there. You can see these, these opinions. Another one, there will be no more disease. In the 20th century, we will use science to conquer all diseases. No matter what they are, somebody will figure out a pill or a shot, and there will never be another disease. Let's just say it now for your notes. The last days of the 19th century, unbelievably optimistic. Science, technology are going to save us in this century. We will no longer need to have wars because everybody's going to resolve their conflicts based on science and technology. Fourteen years later. Jot it in your notes. What am I talking about? 1914. So you're going to write that date down. The point I'm making is crucial to understanding the work of Gates. 1914. 14 years. What's ironic about that date? What's ironic about that date given the year you're sitting in right now? 14 years into the new century. That was going to be this unbelievable century. No more starvation. No more poverty. No more illness or sickness. No more war. We call it the first world war. The effects are staggering. You cannot emphasize enough. The balloon of optimism gets popped with the nasty pen of reality. Think about what happens 14 years into that century we call the 20th century. The conflict begins as a quote-unquote normal war, but very quickly technology makes that war unimaginable horror. For example, they use technology in that war that is banned for all time. There are technologies that are used in the First World War Adolf Hitler will not use. And they use them in the First World War. It's often referred to as mustard gas. The idea was you drop these little tiny explosions. They're not huge. You don't want them to be huge. An invisible gas, kind of yellowish, smoky, will then attend the air where individuals will breathe it, anything liquid immediately is destroyed. It immediately eats out the eyes, it eats out the liquid of the mouth and the lungs. Once taken inside, you literally blow up from the inside out. This gas is used often on the front of the war. It's technology. Much of the battles are early fought in France, in large fields, where they decide to dig large trenches, and guys hide down in the trenches, crawl out, and then shoot at each other. These trenches become where they live. Of course, if you know anything about the weather of France, you have nasty, nasty rains, which of course becomes seriously problematic for the poor blokes living in those trenches when the rains begin to come. Sometimes landslide, mudslides collapse. Sometimes so much rain, men actually drown living in those trenches. Someone comes up with the ingenious idea to invent, technology is wonderful, isn't it? A long-wheeled vehicle that can run over those and just collapse those trenches. Of course, you're familiar with tanks, aren't you, today? And these vehicles of murder, they can kill large numbers of people with an explosion of a single shell. And then, of course, once planes become a part of the technology, you can begin to drop things from the sky in the form of explosions. Large numbers of men will die in a single day. You have tens of thousands of men that can die in a single day in the First World War. No CNN, no Fox News, no embedded reporters during this time, though. No one is covering these wars, these battles. So you've got an interesting dichotomy. Back home, 
In England, for example, everyone is giddy about the notion of the war, killing all the Germans off. It's only when the young men start coming back to England and something's wrong with them. Not only often are they missing body parts and they can't see because of the terrible explosions, but there's something <coughs> wrong with them up here. The experience of the war has fundamentally damaged them. They're never the same again. And we're talking about tens of thousands of kids coming back. And slowly, the optimism of the beginning of the century, 14 years in, is replaced by a dark, dark pessimism. Jot down in your notes, what is pessimism? Jot down what that is. What is, how is pessimism different from optimism? If optimism says, yay, what a great new century we're heading into, what does pessimism say? About the future. What does pessim pessimism say about technology? Are you ready for this? Honestly, what does pessimism say about the ability for our species to survive? Think of it. If you're 14 years in and already horrific disguise, we call it the world war. All over Europe, it's horrific. All over Europe, it's terrible destruction. Total, whole towns like Orland, completely gone. Completely destroyed. It's like when you look at it, you can't even see that a town existed. And then the war ends. And a few years later, guess what? We call it the what? We don't. We do, don't we? We do it all over again. By 1950, that's an important date for you to write down. The Second World War has ended. But it has left people on the planet asking a really disturbing question. Will we make it to the end of the century? Of course, how did the Second World War end? See, this is important to remember. How does the war in Japan end? In. Yeah. We drop a weapon of such tremendous devastative force. So many people are dead in a matter of seconds that people on the ground and around the area say, we're done. We can't do it. Immediately an arms race begins. We know of this time period as the Cold War. It's not a hot war where people are actually dying. It's a cold war. That is to say, the threat of a hot war. A war where nuclear weapons are then used. And by that point, large numbers of people are thoroughly convinced we ain't going to make it out of the century. By the time you're born, there are a lot of people who wonder if we're even going to make it to today. Of course, you're familiar with the devastating effects of the day we call 9-11, right? And the ensuing fear of what the terrorist attacks what are they going to be like? As one writer pointed out on 9-11, if any one of those two planes that had hit those towers had been carrying mustard gas of a kind, had been carrying cyanide that went into the air, it's conceivable that every living person in New York City would be dead by the end of that day. Because once it gets into the atmosphere and the air, you got to breathe, and once you breathe, you're dead. That level of fear at the end of the century was so different from the beginning of the century. Enter Yates. You can see the dates there. He's born in 1865, which makes him how old on 1900? See, do the quick mathematics. So you can see it. Makes him how old by 1900? See how that works? So you can see he's exceptionally, exceptionally optimistic on the one hand about the future as a young man. But on the other hand, he has some real dark reservations about What's coming? Let's now turn to a couple of Yeats' poems, and we'll just get a sense of what's going on with this poet that we will label one of the most important poets of his generation, certainly of the early 20th century. Yeats will have interesting relationships with women. He falls in love with a woman. He's thoroughly convinced it's going to work out. She she refuses to marry him. And in the process, he has a somewhat jaded view then of the whole thing of love. He writes a really interesting poem that we'll look at now on 1140, When You Are Old. Let's just read this poem and then see if you can deduce at all what it is 
that he's so upset about? You might write this down in terms of your annotations for this one and ask the simple question, what is Yates so upset about? Let's take a look at it. When you are old. When you are old and gray and full of sleep, and nodding by the fire, take down this book and slowly read and dream of the soft look your eyes had once and of their shadows deep. How many loved your moments of glad grace and loved your beauty with love false or true? But one man loved the pilgrim soul in you and loved the sorrows of your changing face and bending down beside the glowing bars, murmur a little sadly, how love fled and paced upon the mountains overhead and hid his face amid a crowd of stars. Now, let's just begin by asking a simple question. Is this a happy or a sad poem? What makes this a sad poem? Who is this poem's speaker? And who is this poem's supposed reader? Now, see, we got to deduce some of this, right? So let's go back and look. When you are old and gray and full of sleep. Good. Excellent. Let's write it down. Whoever it is that the speaker is talking to will go ahead and say it is Yates. He is speaking to somebody young, somebody not yet old, somebody not yet gray, somebody not yet. What does full of sleep mean? Some of us today struggle to stay awake during Mr. McGee's lectures. Our head starts to nod. Our eyes want to close. We haven't even hit year 20 yet. What will it be when you hit year 6-0? You know something about old farts. What, is it? what do you know about old farts? They struggle to do what? They do. They Why is that, by the way? Why is it that most old farts, as they age, have a tendency to just want to lay their head down and go to sleep? Do you have any sense of why? <laughs> the energy, right? It's an energy thing. In other words, what's he saying in the opening line? There's going to come a day when you're not so what? You're not so young. You're not so beautiful. You're not so energetic. When that day comes, he says, when you're old and gray and full of sleep and nodding by the fire, take down this book and slowly read and dream of the soft look your eyes had once and other shadows Deep. Whoa, 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 what book? Take down this book. What book? The book this poem is published in. Do you got me? This, by the way, is a direct message to the woman who he loved who did not decide to marry him. Uh -huh. So he writes a poem to her. Now, wait a minute. We're going to ask about this poem if it's a love poem or not. To this point, what would you say? Love poem or no? no. See, some of you would say... Well, he's basically saying when you're old and but ugly, right? When you're old and but ugly, take down this book and read and dream about the soft look your eyes had once. Well, whoa, oh, whoa. Oh. In other words, what's he saying? When you get really old, I hope that when you read this poem, you think about what? The past, right? Keep reading. About your eyes and their shadows deep. How many loved your moments of glad grace and loved your beauty with love false or true. But one man loved the pilgrim soul in you and loved the sorrows of your changing face. See, some of you will say, oh, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. This poem starts to shift and start to sound like a strange kind of love poem. In other words, he asks the girl, you know, are we a thing? And she goes, no. And then he writes a poem where he says, when you're old, I want you to read this poem. Of course, she's reading the poem when she's what? Think about it. She's reading the poem right now when she's what? Young. She's reading the poem when she's young, yes? Young, stunningly beautiful, but he says, I, won't, I don't want you to read it now. I want you to read it, right, way in the future. I want you to read it sometime later. And when you do read it, two things. I want you to remember, remember how beautiful you were and how so many guys wanted to be with you. You were drop-dead gorgeous. Lots and lots of guys wanted to be with you. 
right? When you went to the mall, every guy at the mall looked at you as you walked down the mall, and you knew it, and she did. She knew she was beautiful. She knew all men loved her. But he says, I want you to remember one man from those years long ago. Back to it. One man that loved the pilgrim soul in you. Jot down that line and tell me what you think pilgrim means. What is a pilgrim? You used that term when you were a little child in elementary school around Thanksgiving. They always talked about the pilgrims. What is a pilgrim? And what would a pilgrim soul be? What would it mean to say to a girl you loved, you have a pilgrim soul? What would that even mean? What do you think? Ambitious. Ambitious? What do pilgrims do? Right, they go on adventures, don't they? Those pilgrims went on those adventures across the Atlantic. They also tried to do something no one else had done, right? The girl he loves rejects him because she doesn't want to get married and be tied down. She wants to engage in political action. So she doesn't marry him. It's not she didn't love him. It was that she loved her goals, her ambitions more. He says, I want you to remember a guy who loved the pilgrim soul in you and loved the sorrows of your changing face. Ah, what's that mean? He loved her no matter what she looked like. It wasn't her appearance that other men loved her for her appearance. He says, I didn't love you for your appearance. I loved you for, interestingly, the very thing that took you away from me. Now that's interesting. The very thing that took you away from me, that's what I loved in you. And bending down beside the glowing bars, glowing bars of what? Fire. Fire, good. Murmur a little sadly <coughs> how love fled. Notice love is capitalized. And paced upon the mountains overhead and hid his face amid a crowd of stars. What does he say in the last stanza? Put it in your own notes. He says, I want you to... I want you to remember a little sadly. Wow, interesting. He says, when you're old, I want you to read my poem and be a little sad. A little sad about what? Keep reading. How love fled. Capitalized love fled. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What's he saying to her? She's young. She's beautiful. She's a Victoria's Secret model at the time she's reading this poem. And he says, someday... You ain't going to be no Victoria's Secret. You're going to be old. You're going to be gray. You're going to work just to stay away. Nod, nod. By the fire tonight. That's when I want you to read this poem. And when you do, I want you to remember a certain guy who loved the pilgrim soul in you. And then I want you to be a little sad that what fled? What is he saying? Put it in your own words. What's he saying? What is the point he's making to this girl he loves? One of my students once said, he's saying, you missed out. What does that mean, you missed out? One or two guys that have been jacked and didn't get the girl they wanted would love to write a poem like this. You don't get it now, but someday you will. That is to say, you'll never find another guy that what? That loves, that loves you really like I do. That's why L, capital L, love. Do you notice it? Notice he doesn't say, I fled. I went away. What went away? Love right, your opportunity to have a real, a real lover in your life. A guy who truly loved you, the pilgrim soul in you, that love fled and hid his face amid a crowd of stars. What's that mean, love went away and hid among the crowd of stars? Do you got any idea what that means? There's a lot of word pictures going on here, right? So, for example, she's got lots of guys around her, crowding around her. Some of them are very famous. Yates at the time, not so famous yet. By the time he died, by the way, he was a way famous guy. But at the time he writes this poem, not, not as famous yet. And he says to the girl, Sunday, uh -huh. one or two guys have felt this way if they didn't get the girl. You don't know now, but someday you will. Someday you'll get it. Question for your notes finally. Is this a love poem? Go ahead, write down an answer to this one. Do you qualify this as a love poem? Where he says to her, 
You're a Victoria's Secret model that every guy wants to be with now, but not for long. I'm writing you a poem that I want you to read when everything has sagged and bagged, when nobody's interested in seeing you write beautiful, because you won't be beautiful. When you're old, that's when I want you to read this poem. And when you read the poem, I want you to remember me now and the way in which you walked away. You walked away from capital L love. Is it a love poem? Why do you think he would write a poem like this in terms of the girl? Like, how is she supposed to respond to a letter like this, to a poem like this? What do you imagine he maybe hoped she would do? Right. Say, uh-oh, I, I made a monumental mistake. He's right. I understand how much he loves me. I'm going to come, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do this thing with him. By the way, she did not. <laughs> the poem, the poem didn't work in the moment. What about in the past? What about in the future? Do you think it worked when she got old? See, that's an interesting question, right? Right, that's interesting. Now, let's become reflective for just a moment at 3B and ask this interesting question. Is it possible that one or two high school seniors at Worland High School look back in their senior year? Here we are. Interesting. Last semester of our senior year, right? Look back in their senior year uh, uh, on their high school career and say, if I hadn't done X, I wonder what would have happened. Or Y. You see what I'm saying? If I hadn't done X or Y, if I hadn't done this thing or that thing. Especially in relationships. Follow this one. Especially in relationships. If I had gone out on that date with that person. If I hadn't gone out to that party with that person. I wonder what it would have... Why do you think the human mind often imagines questions like this? I wonder what it would have been like if... And, is that a good idea? Is it a good idea to wonder about the way it would have gone? I once lectured uh, a student <coughs> in this class who had been dating the same girl for a very long time. They were very, very close. But, tick-tock, tick-tock, tick -tock, graduation was coming. What's going to happen after graduation? Everyone was asking, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And I asked this question, what if you'd never met her? Because if you go back in time to the moment that you met her, it's a strange series of events that led to the meeting that could have easily gone another way. You walked a different direction down a hall, you ended up in a different class, you didn't go out for the ball club or whatever where you met her, however it worked out, right? However it worked out. What, what would have happened if you had never met her? Would you be the person you are right now, and how would you be different? How would she be different? Is that a good kind of question to ask or a bad kind of question to ask? And of course, it begs a really intriguing question about going forward. Do you ever really know what each day will hold in terms of a new possible relationship? You never know. People who fall in love will often say after the fact, it wasn't like I got up that morning and said, today is the day I'm going to meet the person. No. Often it happens almost inconsequentially, doesn't it? Like an afterthought. And then you look back and you go, whoa, all of these experiences happened and I really wasn't even aware they were happening at all. Which begs a really intriguing question about the future. What will it look like? Let's go now to Lake Isle of Innsbruck on page 1141. This is a fairly simple poem. It's not very difficult to uh, work with. But I do have seniors that say in a very complicated senior semester, this poem speaks to them in ways lots of other poems just frankly do not. I'm going to actually begin at 3A. Do you remember a chap named Henry David Thoreau? T-H-O-R-E-A-U. An American writer who outside of Boston is a little town called Concord. Outside of Concord is a little woods with a pond there named Walden. W-A-L-D-E-N. Thoreau decides, you'll maybe remember from your junior experience of study, Thoreau decides to leave Concord, to go out into the woods, to, to, to build a little tiny hut next to that pond named Walden, where he lived. For two years he lived, all alone. He lived for two years. And he wrote journals. Upon returning, he published those journals and just called them Walden after the pond next to his house. And that publishing becomes a really important moment in American transcendental thought. 
His fundamental message was simply this. Life gets really busy. And you, and you sometimes fail to understand what really matters. So going out and spending a little time alone in the woods is not a bad idea at all. He did it for two years, right? Interestingly, Yates will have a very similar kind of observation, interestingly, close to the very same time. Innsbruck is a beautiful little place tucked away, far, far away from all of the craziness of life. Look what he says. I will arise and go now and go to Innsbruck. And a small cabin built there of clay and wattles made, nine bean rows will I have there a hive for the honey bee and live alone in the bee loud clay. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings there, midnight's all a glimmer and noon a purple glow and evening full of the linnet's wings. I'll arise and go now, for always night and day I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore while I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's gray. I hear it in the deep heart's core. I want to start at line 11. And I want to ask a simple question. Where is he at line 11? Can you deduce? Go ahead, read the line at line 11, and then jot down in your notes, where is he when he's actually speaking? He says, opening line, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go. But where is he at line 11? Do you have a sense of it? While I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's gray means what? He's on a sidewalk, which tells you he's where? He's in the city, isn't he? In other words, what's the distinction we're making here? Life in the city, where there's noise, where there's craziness, versus life where? Where he wants to go. Right? Which begs a really intriguing question, especially on a morning like this, sitting in a room like this. If you could be one other place on this planet right now, jot down at 3B, where would that be for you? Some of us will say, I don't care as long as it's someplace warm. Where would you be right now? If you could shut your eyes and when they open, you would be at that place. Where would that be for you? And what about that place would be different from this place? Why did you pick that place? What is it different about this place? Because, hello, if you don't have one of those places, then you're very happy to be here right now. Let's point it out. In this poem, he wants to go somewhere, but why? Why does he want to go where he wants to go? What is missing in his life? He wants to be alone. There's too many people around him. Keep going. Doesn't like all the people. By definition, as well, extension, the noise, right? He wants, what's the P word? He wants peace, doesn't he? He wants to go to a place where it's peaceful. Notice how many things he wants to go to. A small cabin, a little garden, some things flying in the air. He'd like to get away from it all. Why do you think he wants to get away from it all? where he says, peace comes dropping slow. You almost can't read that line without reading it nice and slow. Life, he says, has gotten too cluttered, too fast. I'd like to slow everything down. Wouldn't it be nice right now to just be sitting next to a beautiful ocean, laying back on a little reclining chair, and the wind is blowing a bit, the breeze, it's about a balmy 87, 90 degrees. But the question is, why does that sound good to you right now? See, you can say, well, because I'm not there. Is it true that in the human condition, we seem to often want what it is we don't have? And why is that? And why is it so hard for us to be content with wherever we are? And would you actually be happy if you were to go to this place, but you had to go alone? See, that was only the first part of my question. If you could shut your eyes and open them, you'd be there. My next question, part of the question was, is there anybody you'd want with you? Or would you want to be alone? Some of my students will say, I don't want anybody else there. I want to be totally alone. To which I say, for how long? 
Because sooner or later, it seems we have a tendency to want to share the experience with somebody. Who would you like to share an experience like that with? Ah, now we can join the two titles together, huh? Right? Yates inviting his girl to come with him, and she said, no. So he says, fine, I'll go there alone, and I'll write a poem about when you're an old woman. I hope you have a poem to read that'll make you remember. <laughs> Interesting. Thanks, guys. An introduction to Yates. Come back tomorrow. We'll do a little bit more.